Okay, well, uh, I've kept the title fairly, um, uh, what's, uh, fairly vague because, um, well, if you could see this, it, it actually says history of construction. Uh, but the reason being that I wasn't sure quite construction covers a, a load of things. And uh, when I started off, I suppose we've got a airfix models, a bit of Meccano. I'm not quite sure what that is. And uh, then got on to the actual uh, electronics. Um, I, uh, it was quite difficult when I was thinking about this to actually pinpoint a time when I actually started in electronics. And it's very interesting that Colin brought along said um, record player because I think my first experience of electronics was probably destructive rather than constructive. Taking apart things like that and uh, old uh, radiograms, if you can remember those things, uh, to have a look, see what was inside. And uh, they generally, after I would had a play with them, didn't work. So I'm not saying they worked before, but they certainly didn't afterwards. Uh, okay, so ca having said that, oh, yes. Um, I suppose the uh, electronics started probably when I was about 11 or 12. Uh, and I, I, the uh, picture of Cornwall, if you can see it, I was brought up in Cornwall um, just about, ooh, where's it gone? Just about there. Again, it's not as big as I thought it might be. Uh, and uh, yes, I used to, um, back in this uh, 60s, there's no internet and little TV, at least for children in the uh, evening. So what I would do is find things to do on my own. And uh, during the summer wasn't too bad because br uh, light evenings you could go out and play. Um, and there were quite, the village was such that Unfortunately, there weren't very many other friends I had from school in the village. About the closest one was a girl who lived about three miles away and didn't tend to go and see her very often, being a girl. Uh, so I was fairly, um, I suppose, lonely and needed things to do during the winter, which is hence... Uh, oh, I've gone a bit uh, beyond myself. I uh, actually... Sorry, I've gone off track a bit. So as I say, I lived on my own with my dad and uh, I used to look forward to a monthly trip into Falmouth, which was on the, uh, on the map, which was over here, uh, to go to the toy shop and have a look around. And I was thinking as I thought back to those days, it's probably a little bit like going around Martin Lynch's. You turn up and you've got that anticipation of, Oh, what shall I buy here? And it was very much like that to me. And uh, it was my birthday, or somewhere around my birthday. Um, I think it was probably about 11 or 12. And I, so I had this money, and I was all set to go off to the toy shop to have a look. And Falmouth was the best toy shop, so I'd managed to persuade my dad that he'd take me into Falmouth. But... Like most things in the country, or at least Cornwall, nev things never go quite as smoothly as you want it. Uh, set off to go, the bus wasn't running. So managed to get a, a lift with a builder into St Moore's, which is sort of on one side of the estuary, and uh, all intent to take a ferry across the other side, passenger ferry, but got there and the weather had rather turned and it, the wind had come up and it was rather choppy and the um, I can remember quite clearly the uh, captain of the ship or ferry um, there was a big crowd of people because he hadn't been able to uh, use go across the on the earlier ferry he decided it was too rough but with a bit of pressure he decided he would tr uh, try and go across 
and, uh, but said it was a, a passenger's own risk, <laughs> something you probably wouldn't get away with nowadays. Uh, so we set off, and I must say it was the worst, well, the, the, the choppiest, stormiest trip I've ever been on. The boat, as you can see, is not massive, and uh, certainly had to back, batten all the hatches down because the spray was breaking over the front of the boat and everyone was huddled uh, down here, not like the nice picture at all. Uh, eventually, we got across and the captain decided that was it. And everybody thanked him for a really interesting uh, voyage. <laughs> and uh, he said, I'm not going to sea again today. So but I was... Well, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so, right, uh, off, first of all, I, I, off to have lunch, and I discovered at that point that I don't suffer from seasickness, because one thing I'd seen on the sh on board was loads of people s um, being sick over the side, and uh, as one does, and I discovered I get car sick, but not seasick. So... Uh, then it was off to the toy shop, and uh, I had, had about something like about fifty pounds, and so I could afford almost everything in the shop. I bet it was a lot of money. Then. It was a lot of money back in nineteen sixty. Well, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, but then I spent about, I suppose, an hour or so looking around the shop, and all I could find was things either they were a bit too childish, or they were. Um, things I'd already got. got and didn't find that interesting. So the, um, back then, the shopkeepers were very helpful, and I remember him uh, pulling out a whole load of things and trying to interest real salesmen. Nah, didn't like that, didn't like that. Eventually, I got onto what they termed the educational toys, which I'd already had a go at with one of the uh, chemistry sets and been very, um, well, disappointed when I couldn't blow the world up. <laughs> I think all children get to that point. And, but uh, I did spot these, if you can see, and I don't know if anybody here ever picked these up, Philips electronic sets. Yeah. And the uh, shopkeeper got these out and opened them up, and I was peering inside at a whole load of little components and thinking, oh, this looks interesting. So I think that was probably my first experience with electronics, well, building. Uh, I went, the, as to the question of uh, going home, there was a, an alternative route back home, but it took a, two long bus uh, journeys and quite a big wait in between. That's why I didn't tend to go that way but eventually arrived home with these two big um, brown paper parcels, because shops always seem to do things up in brown paper then. Lots of sellotape and lots of brown paper. Uh, got home and opened them up, and uh, immediately I was thinking I was going to build um, miniature transceivers, sort of like they had on The Man From U.N.C.L.E., because that used to be one of my favourite programmes, and I was had all these visions of miniature trans transceivers that I could go around the village in with. Uh, but I soon discovered that um, they weren't quite up to that. Uh, as you can see, oh, where have we gone? Oh, was, sorry, going back a, a stage. As you can see, uh, the components didn't really lend themselves to miniaturization. And I did manage to make some police sirens and a th one or two other things that sort of kept my interest up. And then I struck upon a super het trawler band receiver and built that and started listening. So apart, rather than building things, I now actually had something to listen to. So I suppose that was my introduction to amateur radio, if we go on. Uh, uh, back then... As I say, no internet, uh, very little publicity, no Maplin and no, no nice shops to go to. Um, I relied on Wireless World, Practical Wireless, 
and one or two other things I could find around. And I started to get to the stage where I thought, this trawler band's fine, but there must be more than just one, one band out there. And uh, I saw in uh, probably Practical Wireless, actually, this exciting gift for any boy or girl. Uh, it's a Hack 1 radio. And I think that was my first proper shortwave radio. Um, in this, it didn't have just one band, it had four, and covered up to, I think it was up to 30 megs. Uh, but it wasn't quite like a modern receiver in that, A, it didn't have a mains power supply, it all ran off batteries. Um, B, it didn't have a, a band changer, so you had to plug different coils into the top to change the band, which was okay. My dad made a nice wooden box for it so that I wouldn't burn my fingers. Uh, and, oh, I better go back one step, sorry, to building it. I ordered it, it arrived, tore open the box, uh, and unfortunately I hadn't looked ahead, planned things very well, and realised suddenly, oh, you're going to need a soldering iron. So again, it was a look around um, our nearest town, and I got something not dissimilar to this, wooden handle, wo wobbly soldering bit, and huge. But it, it managed it, so uh, I don't know if anybody else has been faced with that sort of thing. I have seen worse. They were the old-fashioned type that you had to stick in the fire. And I have resorted to that in, on some occasions. They're just the advantages of having an old man as a manager of bakery. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I, so that was my first uh, full coverage sh shortwave radio. And I did bring it along today just to uh, show a bit of antique. So did you add the bit on the top uh, with the burning or anything? No, the, that was an addition. Um, okay. I think you, you bought the bit at the bottom and then you could add on later a, uh, what's a, a bent piece of metal and a vernier, which ran off the same, uh, I think it parallel up, possibly one of those dials. Right, okay. So that was my first, and I started then uh, becoming aware that a radio on its own is not much good. You need an antenna. And I was very fortunate to, it gets quite stormy down in Cornwall, to discover that a number of the telephone lines had come down around the village and ended up in the sea. And being a good wrecker, I went out and uh, retrieved some of these <laughs> and uh, got myself a nice long wire antenna. Mystery man steals telephone. <laughs> well, it was in the sea. The laws of wrecking is you can go and uh, yes, retrieve it. In the sea, you can. Yes, exactly. And uh, I, so I built, built what's known as a beverage antenna up the garden. These uh, poles being replaced by apple trees. And uh, I even stuck a little resistor at the end. But I never found out that made much difference. Uh, and uh, after that, so that was my first foray into antenna design, although I didn't design it, I, or construction. Uh, after I discovered that, this end sort of disappeared up the roof into my bedroom. Uh, and I, after that, uh, purchased an ATU kit. And... Uh, so you basically turned it into a long line? Yes. Because it's too far up at one end. Yes, probably. Uh, right, so, and it says it goes 7 to 21. Well, I think my antenna worked quite nicely up to uh, probably, well, certainly up to 30 megs. Um, it was, I was helped because 
uh, the situation down where the house was uh, faced, I think it was facing east, or it might have actually been west, on second thoughts. The, the east at least used to blow in, so that probably meant it was facing west. And where it was at the bottom of the hill, it, it just worked perfectly for HF. Unfortunately, afterwards, I bought a VHF uh, radio because I, I knew there were some VHF bands, two-metre bands, to try and have a listen there, but never actually got anything. Um, I managed to get some uh, aircraft on the air band, but never managed to get any amateurs, I think because there was a great big hill behind me, and that was in the direction of the probably most of the amateurs would be, certainly at VHF. Um, so th that might have been my second uh, construct, well, second and third construction projects. I also uh, later discovered in the village that there was one amateur, although he was only there part-time. He uh, worked for Rachel Decker and would come down to the village on occasion when he wasn't abroad and f eventually we got to meet and uh, he was very encouraging. I told him what I, about my uh, one or two valve radio as it was and what I'd been listening to and he sa said, oh, you probably need something a little better. And so uh, he, you can just about see, he lent me this, which was a Lafayette, uh, which some people may have seen. It's, it dates back certainly to uh, 19, probably beginning 1960. And uh, so I got that and I started listening. Uh, and But at the time, it was around the time that I was uh, just about to go off to sixth form. And uh, unfortunately, pressure of all sorts of other things meant that uh, I think it was probably girlfriends um, going out to the pub, although not quite, well, not exactly legally at that time, and uh, other things. Stop most of this. Huh? Oh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, homework went in there somewhere. Yeah. It meant that uh, I ha didn't really do a lot for quite a long time until, um, I suppose, I finished the sixth form, and uh, then I purchased this. It's a Kodar CR70 and uh, pre-selector, which I still have at home. I haven't turned it on for a while, so I'm hoping it might work. Uh, and uh, a little bit later, I also bought this, which I can't even remember what it is. Uh, but it, it had the advantage on that one that it... Uh, had a true synthesizer, which in those days was fairly rare. It looks a bit icon or Yosi like, doesn't uh, it? Yes, I, or trio, I'm not sure. Um, yes, sorry, I, I'm not sure on that one. It may still be up in the loft somewhere. I think there's a label on it somewhere. Yeah, there probably is. Is it an FRG7? No. Oh, no. 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 Um, yes, sorry, I'll get back on script again. You won't be surprised that with so much exposure to technical subjects, I eventually uh, ended up at Salford University doing electronics. And uh, it was there that uh, I was keen to look around and see if there was an amateur radio society. Unfortunately not. So I signed up to Campus Radio which seemed close, and a computer club, which again were s sort of close. Um, oh, what's happened here? Uh, oh, so, sorry. Uh, again, I've not quite got them in order. I, um, to add to the Kodar CR70, I actually bought a Q multiplier and an audio no noise uh, filter. Both of them came out, I think, of probably practical wireless. Or they may have come out of Ridecom at the time. Right. Uh, 
there's just a few of the things that while I was at sixth form I built uh, some people might recognize them I together with somebody else we built a uh, single uh, board pr microprocessor which was fairly unique at the time it was good being a flagship uh, sixth form college that they encouraged a lot of uh, other extracurricular activities and I think myself and somebody else did that one um, you know what it is? it's I think it's a NASCOM okay. if anybody can remember back then about no, early 70s oh, it was early 70s and this heap of um <laughs> we also uh, attempted to build this wonderful Sinclair amplifier that never really worked very well at all. It hummed like nobody's business. It hissed, hissed like nobody's business. And if you dared turn any of the pots, you got all this crackle. Because for some reason, they decided to design um, feature, put all the DC through the uh, controls, which doesn't really help. Um, what I did... I did quite well at the sixth form and got some good A-level results at this bought for me, um, which was very good. It was a Drake mm -hmm. SW4. Mm. Four A, well, four A, four something. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference in them was. There was some difference on the. Yeah, it had an A on it. Uh, yes. Um, sorry, I'll just have a. So what does it do? What's the SW4? It's a general coverage uh, shortwave radio, which I was going to take off to university and never quite got there. So having finished A-levels, I looked around and ended up as one does. Well, I actually, it's quite a long story why I ended up at Salford. I may have told a few people. Uh, and so no amateur radio club that I could find uh, but there was a campus radio that was in its infancy um, and my, I was I think one of the five or six founding members it turned out I went along and no and there was nobody else in this conference room so uh, oh you're this you're that and the way it goes and uh, there was two of us, myself and John, we did most of the technical work and another chap, Stuart, who uh, was station manager, but had the advantage of uh, being, he was in his third year and was able to go around all the electronics companies and... Uh, Flag bits of kit. Yes. <laughs> so we had quite a good uh, studio. Unfortunately, we hadn't got to the stage where we had anything to transmit on yet. Uh, he had designed this low-power uh, loop system, and there's a couple of interesting stories about that. Uh, we used to... I'll try and get in the right order. We um, worked on the studio uh, quite late most evenings because, unfortunately, the, um, it was a commentary tower that the uh, radio station was... Um, housed in and uh, that was right next to the door to the student union bar which meant that you couldn't really go in up there until after the bar closed so it was a case was of a bit convenient because you could go in the bar first couldn't you? well yes you you could so you just in case you were thirsty <laughs> and uh, one night we were in there i uh, do remember and uh, I've gone back again, yeah. and uh, we were all gathered around this mixer or mixing desk, trying to work out where the hum was coming from. And uh, so you must understand, we'd all had a f one or two pints, uh, and we're poking around inside this mixer while it's still switched on, looking for the hum. So Stuart comes up, and we think, "Ooh, that's nice." turned up in this brand new uh, jumper that his sort of long-term girlfriend had uh, knitted for him. Very nice sort of uh, colours. And uh, 
we're all bending over this mixer trying to see what's going on. And the next moment, we, there's this strange smell. And it doesn't really smell like electronics. And uh, next moment, Stuart jumps up howling, oh dear me, or something like that. Uh, and there's a big burn mark across his back. I didn't... Um, he was sitting on a soldering iron. <laughs> so that was the first funny story I remember. The um, a second one was... Uh, John the second one was the disengagement from his girlfriend. Well, yeah. yeah he, they managed to keep together somehow. I think he hit the jumper. <laughs> it wasn't quite his colour or something. Uh, but, but no, we were also going around the student union village uh, putting in these mini loop antennas one day. And we weren't allowed in the female quarters after dark, so we had to do it in the afternoon. So there was only one afternoon we were free. So we were going round, and John's crawling around up in the loft. And the next moment, there's an enormous crash and a howl from the, the resident. And John's, most of John's fallen through the ceiling. <laughs> so th they were the two the things that stand out about the university, apart from probably there were a few lectures. Uh, okay, um, why have I put all this here? Well, because one of the uses of my room was to build some, I was still building things, I built some loudspeakers, and I did try and learn Morse at one stage, because I was going to try and get a license then, but other things got in the way. Uh, there was lots of things to get in the way. Lots of well, there was beer, the, there was girlfriends, there was uh, going out for... And th then there was lectures. They really got in the way. So uh, th that's why that's there. Uh, the loudspeakers I have somewhere up in my loft, but they never quite looked like that. And I also had a few... Uh, few uh, meetings with the uh, computer club in, uh, in Manchester. So that was why that was there. It's a RISC user and we did, well, I did play around with uh, RISC chips and things. Uh, and also, good old Maplin was still going then, or I think it just started. And uh, I th believe that was how we tested the mixers. So uh, it was all fairly basic. Uh, right, carrying on. So when I finished there, this is the bit where, which John was talking about. Um, I looked around for somewhere to, to work. And uh, based on who produced, provided the best beer and the best meal, it ended up as being Rachel. John might be surprised at that one. Uh, and one of my first jobs was looking at these. Hands up. Who recognises it? I've got one. Oh, you've got one. <laughs> yes. I spent uh, the first three months I, after I'd finished uh, doing a soldering course again, um, trying to fix RA-17s. And uh, the way we fixed them was one came through the door. It had lots of nice parts, shiny parts on it, but it might not have been quite working. We took the shiny parts off the one that came through the door and put them on the one that was ready to go out the door, because just waiting spares. And so we had this sort of bucket brigade system for fixing RA-17s, which date, I think the RA-17 dates back to just post-war anyway, so we were doing quite well. Um, part of the, I can't tell you too much about what I was doing there, but part of the time I was there was, um, working on these uh, Land Rovers, uh, handheld transceivers. Qu spent quite a long time looking at mini loops. Uh, and why is the Lamborghini in there? Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Right. I discovered a very interesting um, amateur, King Hussein of Jordan, oh, right. and got to meet him on the reason... For the Lamborghinis there, got to meet him on a couple of occasions when he came to Rakel, and he turned up outside Rakel in this Lamborghini. Now, 
all the people who were waiting for him to arrive assumed he was going to be chauffeured in. He turned up in the driving seat, uh, quite through them. But uh, I produced a system for him, and uh, part of this system involved this huge log P he was going to put on his palace, and he was going to put his amateur radio kit through it. So there was a, had to be a changeover switch. So this nice glass-fronted uh, amateur radio installation that he has would go through the professional log P. So if anybody heard him, that's why his antenna system was rather incredible. Um, all right, what else have we got here? Uh, that's an old board. Uh, I don't think anybody could work out what it is from it. That's why I stuck it in there. That was the sort of technology that I was working on probably most of the time. And uh, as one of the things I did work on, which is probably a bit more modern, was we worked on a DSP-based uh, waterfall system, which uh, were, at the time was pretty cutting edge. And uh, the mini loop uh, spent many an hour on top of the Rakel building trying to uh, recalibrate and reset those. So, right, it got to the stage then that I'd moved around Rakel to a probably about three or four different locations. And another part of my life came back in that when I was at university, I found God, or he found me. And uh, I felt a calling to leave Rakel and go out to Africa. I'd already been to, Afri to Zimbabwe a couple of times before and felt a calling to go out to, to Zimbabwe. And uh, I left here, resigned, uh, and went out to uh, probably uh, north of, north, yes, uh, sorry, south, down about where the A is, a farm, and uh, spent about six months, eight months working on putting electricity in and uh, playing around with three phase and not a lot of radio, uh, though quite a lot of computers because they had a lot of computers that weren't working so that was that stage but then I felt I w went for a visit across to Mozambique and that was a lot more lower tech and uh, had a lot greater needs so I felt that I should go over to Mozambique and I worked over in Mozambique then for getting on for seven years and uh, some of the things I did there was I there I met another amateur, a uh, Japanese chap, and we put up a number of dipole antennas, or say we, mostly I did, uh, and a, a big log P using a nice big eucalyptus tree as the mast, and then laying out the um, log P around the tree. So theoretically it was steerable, but we set it in one place and left it. Uh, that was really designed uh, using that nice little book, the ARRL -A -R -R handbook. Uh, why have I got that in there? Not sure. Don't know where that came. That might have crept in from the wrong place. Um, anyway, I also spent some time putting in some radio links to some of the vehicle vehicles we had. So. I've got some, probably getting back to the amateur radio again, got some taxi radios and put them in with some antennas and also set up a link down to another property we had, which was about 500 k's away. And the Japanese provided the equipment and we had to install, put in a couple of antennas. So again, I was back into the antenna building. Um, and unfortunately, I haven't got any of the photos because they were all on slides, so otherwise I would have brought some, but I haven't transferred any of those over. Then things in Africa, certainly in Mozambique, started to improve. The South Africans put a lot of money in, and we actually started getting things like supermarkets, uh, ice cream sh shop at one stage, uh, and 
technology started to come in and it had always been the mission's leader, the le leader of the mission's vision to replace the people who were there with um, natives, natives or, or the ethnic uh, population. So I had been uh, training one of the young chaps I'd met in Zimbabwe earlier um, to basically take over and I was doing the electrics, a bit of the computing and the communications and also plumbing and a whole long long list of stuff but I, I started training him and he went off to Zimbabwe and managed to pass the equivalence of the H&D in Zimbabwe uh, and at that stage I felt I'm not sure if I'm needed here anymore and looked to going back to England again and uh, come on and ended up after a couple of stops in a couple of smaller companies at uh, L3 Harris. Now, because it's getting a bit close, the technology is a bit uh, newer there, I've not been able to take or show very much apart from what's on the website. So it's, again, tactical communications. Uh, and I'm mainly working in uh, test departments, so it's working on trying to keep this loss that's in here running. It's all been designed, it's test equipment that was designed pre-2000 and it's all starting to fall over. And uh, we've got s some, uh, that's all run by computer systems which are probably of the same vintage and the software we're discovering is definitely of the same vintage. So that's what I've been doing there. While I was at Harris, though, I did have to go up into my loft and uh, move a whole load of stuff and uh, discovered, well, amongst other things, that and uh, started uh, getting back into amateur radio. And I suppose that brings us almost back to date, up to date, because then I came along to the meetings here and uh, took initially a uh, foundation license, then intermediate, and then because of COVID it got delayed, the uh, uh, full license. And since then I've been busily building other things. So uh, I started off with uh, v building VHF antennas. I haven't got a picture of that, but also uh, interesting columns talking about these Arduinos. I've been that's the Arduino play pen, uh, and I've got a close-up of that. I'm looking at trying to uh, build a VSWR meter, and uh, that's still a bit ongoing. It's gone a bit further than that, but not much. Uh, so I'm trying to get the Arduino to talk to a couple of power sensors at the moment, uh, and that's one project. Another project that's got a bit further in that it's almost into a box is that I'm building an automatic ATU. Uh, this, the board and the components all came off, uh, um, I think it's an American design, but on, off the web. Uh, you can find all sorts of things on the web. Uh, this I've dug out of my loft again, and I think it's a it's a transceiver board with a couple of uh, sideband filters. So I'll be having a look at that. Um, what else have we got? This is all sort of current-ish. Uh, I just need more time. And uh, so what next? Well, at the moment, I'm thinking, I've just uh, been talking to my boss and uh, coming to the conclusion that I probably need to retire to get enough time to do all these things. Because yeah. nowadays there are so man many opportunities to build things. Um, I think that I made a bit of a list, but there's, there's if you go on the internet, there are just so many uh, designs around. I brought a few books 
because there's a load of uh, resources on RSGB. Um, and if you can't find enough there to build, design your own, because there's always going to be something out there. Uh, I Do you know our little um, Bluetooth uh, earpieces? They were supposed to look like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did, did you oh, not yes. see? Yes. So ah. we, you well, you were the first one. one. Oh, right. One. So um, <laughs> Colin found this ad for uh, an, a scope that was probably the same as that. <laughs> Supposedly, it looked like that uh, for about 20 quid. <laughs> and we all knew it wasn't going to happen. No. We all bought one on PayPal. So, ah. of course, when it didn't turn up as a scope, and we got all these little things like a, I got a tiny little useless oh. Bluetooth earpiece and things that like that. Ah. Bluetooth is useful for Tony. <laughs> yeah. So, we, uh, well, it gave us something to talk about. Well, that is one thing that, talking about uh, miniaturization, though. Um, one thing nowadays is that science fiction is now becoming fact in that with all the surface mount components around, what you need, which I haven't shown in there, is a mi either a microscope or a yeah. magnifier because you just can't see things otherwise. Yeah, that's right. And so that's sort of been the as ex uh, essential nowadays. Right, well, thank you very much. Any questions before I... Oh, yes. That didn't include the cones themselves, did it? No, that the was, that was the box, the and it. yes. They all came from this wonderful little company that used to be in Liverpool called Wimslow Audio, or close to. I remember that because I remember going over and trying to collect plans. And back in the days where you, loudspeakers came in plans, and my, my university room was full of sawdust, but that was better than most people's. <laughs> Right, thanks very much. Thank you. And if anybody wants to have a browse, I, I did bring a few books along, see if anybody gets uh, inspired.